question for you men. How many of you asked for permission to marry your spouse, right? I read a letter this week that, um, a letter that made such a request, and I want to share it with you this morning. Uh, this letter was from Adoniram Judson, uh, and Adoniram Judson was America's first foreign missionary. Uh, and so this was a letter from Adoniram Judson to John Hasseltine, uh, the father of Anne Hasseltine, who Mr. Judson wanted to marry before leaving the States to go to Burma. And this is the letter that Mr. Judson wrote. He said, I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life. Whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps even a violent death. Can you consent to all of this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God? Can you consent to all of this in hopes of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory with the crown of righteousness, brightened with the acclamations of praise which shall redound her to her Savior from heathen saved through her means from eternal woe and despair. Uh, listen, when I asked Becky's parents for permission, it was in their living room with Wheel of Fortune on in the background, right? So there's a little bit of a difference here. John Hasseltine responded by saying uh, she can make up her own mind. And so in 1812, Adoniram and Anne were married, and they immediately set sail to go to Burma. It turns out that the letter that Adoniram wrote to his would-be father-in-law was much more prophetic than he realized at the time. You see, in 1824, Adoniram was put in prison for 18 months. And while he was in prison, uh, he was nearly crippled from torture. At night, he would be hoisted up in the air by shackles uh, from his ankles uh, with only his head and his shoulders touching the ground, and that's how he slept. But soon after landing in prison, he found out that he was going to be a dad, that Anne was expecting, and she would walk two miles every day to plead for Adoniram's release, but to no avail, right? Right? Soon, their daughter Maria was born, but after giving birth, Anne became very sick, became very thin, and Anne's milk dried up, and she had no way to feed baby Maria. Eventually, the, the jailer had mercy on Adoniram and began to let him out of prison every evening uh, for just a few hours so that he could take Maria and go to uh, a neighboring village and, and beg for other nursing mothers to feed her. Adoniram was released from prison just in time to watch Anne die, and then just Months later, Maria, his daughter, died as well. Adoniram married again, but his second wife also died on the mission field. And six other children that he had, he would bury in Burma before dying himself at age 61. This morning we are continuing a series called From Here to There. And sometimes what we need to get from here to there, sometimes what we need to get from where we are to where we need to be is a little perspective. And so my challenge for you this morning is to understand that the point of this life is not our own pleasure, it's not our own happiness, and it's not our own success. But there's much more at stake than what we realize. So today, uh, this morning, we want to talk about going from the temporary to the eternal. Going from here to there, the temporary to eternal. 
In this series, we're taking, just, uh, we're taking a look at just a few paragraphs in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So if you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. Um, but Paul is writing to Timothy, uh, who's a church leader in Ephesus. And Paul tells Timothy to make sure to tell the people these things about how to live out their faith in the world. And what we're going to see today is that he tells them to stop looking at life through the lens of what is temporary and start looking at life through the lens of what is eternal. Start having a perspective that is influenced by your eternal destination, not just your temporary pleasure or comfort or convenience or happiness. You see, when we look at our lives through the lens of eternity, then what Adoniram and Ann Judson did doesn't seem so crazy. I mean, if our lives are truly just a mist, as the Bible says, that we're only here for a moment and then we're gone, then what Adoniram and Ann Judson did makes a lot of sense. Yet when we hear a story like theirs, it's instinctive. I mean, we can't help it. We feel sorry for them. We think about everything that they gave up, and we think to ourselves, you know what, I, I bet if Ann Judson would have known what was going to happen, she wouldn't have married Adoniram. But here's the deal. Ann Judson knew exactly what she was doing. Uh, before leaving, she wrote this letter to a friend of hers. Uh, let me read it to you. She writes, I feel will willing and expect, if nothing in providence prevents, to spend my days in this world in heathen lands. Yes, Lydia, I have about come to the determination to give up all of my comforts and enjoyments here, sacrifice my affection to relatives and friends, and go where God in his providence shall see fit to place me. My determinations are not hasty or formed without viewing the dangers, trials, and hardships attendant on a missionary life. You see, Anne knew what she was giving up. She knew who she was saying goodbye to. She knew she was saying goodbye to her family. And so, although we hear her story and, and we can't help but feel sorry for her, I can't help but think that if Ann Judson were with us today, She'd feel sorry for us. Why? Because we get caught up in the temporary trappings of this world. She'd feel sorry for us because on our way home today, we're going to sit at a stoplight for a few seconds longer than we think we should have to. And I mean, there are no other cars around. You'd think they'd come up with a better way uh, to do things, right? We're going to go home, and, and it'll take like five minutes to steam cook our vegetables in the microwave. Five minutes! I thought those things were supposed to cook fast. She'd feel sorry for you and me because in light of eternity, she's not regretting the investment that she made. In light of what she's received in heaven, she has no regrets. It's a good investment when you live your life with eternity in mind. And you say, well, Pastor Joshua, how do you know what she received in heaven? How can you make that statement? Because Jesus said it. Matthew chapter 19, uh, verse, verses 28 through 30, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone who, have, who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or fields, for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Jesus basically says that the point of this life is to prepare for the next. And that those who sacrifice, those who don't live for themselves, but those who live for Jesus and his kingdom, that he says there's an enormous rate of return that awaits you. When we live life with eternity in mind, we are making a good investment. 
So let's lay some groundwork real quickly, and then we're going to get into the passage that we want to land on. I want you to read 1 Timothy chapter 6 with me. Um, we're going to start in verse 6, okay? Um, chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul says a lot of things here, and we're very familiar with the love of money passage. But overall, Paul is saying, don't get so caught up in, con- in the convenience and the comforts of this life. And again, Timothy is ministering in Ephesus, okay? And Ephesus was a lot more developed than you might think. Wealthy people in Ephesus, they had indoor plumbing. They'd even figured out a way to have hot and cold water. And so Paul is saying, don't think for a second, don't think for a second that your life is defined by how much stuff you've got. Whether or not you've got indoor plumbing, whether or not you drive a Porsche or a Pontiac, right? No matter what kind of home you live in, don't look at this life through the lens of temporary comforts and conveniences. Be intentional to look at life through the lens of eternity. Now, look at verse 17 with me. And this is kind of where we want to land. This is the passage where we want to land. Verse 17. He says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Paul says, don't put your hope in money and stuff It's temporary. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. He says, use your money to invest in something that will last. And he gives us three things. First, he says, do good. He says, do good to others. Be rich in good deeds. Don't just write a check. Demonstrate your love. Demonstrate kindness and compassion. Second, he says to be generous to those in need. That's intentional sacrifice. That's intentional sacrificial giving. And third, he says, be ready to share with others. In other words, have an open-handed approach to life. That is, when you have the opportunity to be generous, that your spirit is going to be open-handed. That if you can, then you will. Luke chapter 12 Jesus gives us a parable that unpacks this a little bit. So I'm going to ask you to flip back in your Bible to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. And and, and these are parallel passages, uh, but Jesus uses this story to help us kind of put some skin on it and see what it looks like when we live this out. So so here's the context of Luke, chapter 12. Uh, Jesus has been teaching... And it's pretty hardcore teaching, right? Uh, He says things like, don't worry about what other people think about you because they don't have the power to throw you into hell. He says in verse 5, he says, worry about what God thinks. Fear God because he is the one that has the power to throw you into hell. And so while he's teaching somebody in the crowd, and and I don't know, it doesn't really seem like that he's really paying attention to what Jesus is saying. But he kind of interrupts Jesus with a question. Look at it with me in verse um, verse 13. He says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Okay? So Jesus is teaching about eternal things. He's saying, Don't worry about all of this other stuff. Fear God. Worry about what God thinks, right? 
And this guy's got a question about something that's pretty temporary. He says, tell my brother to divide the inheritance. So what we probably have is this younger brother, and he doesn't think that he's being treated fairly. You see, the Levitical law allowed for the older brother, the the eldest brother, to get two-thirds of the inheritance, and then the younger brother would get a third of the inheritance in a situation presumably like this one. Now, that was the official law. But oftentimes, when a brother loved, when brothers loved each other very well, um, it would be dealt with a little more evenly. And so that's probably the scenario that we're reading here. The younger brother probably only got one third, and he thinks that things should be dealt with a little more equitably. And so it seems like he's asking Jesus a question about money, but he's really not. He's telling Jesus to agree with what he already thinks about money. Now, this is how most of us approach not only money, but pretty much everything. We open the Bible, and not so much with this open mind or this soft heart to what God might want to teach us, but we open the Bible with an agenda. It's almost like we're saying, God, I I just want to make sure that you agree with me on this issue. We want to make sure that Jesus is is on our side. Like, Jesus, could, could you just sign off on this? Jesus, could you just justify my position here? We want Jesus to agree with us. So this guy had lost some perspective. Uh, He's putting the inheritance, something that is very temporary, above the teaching of Jesus on eternal things, and likely above his relationship with his brother. Uh, Can I tell you, I have seen this so many times as a pastor, working with families, uh, you know, when a loved one dies, and go to the funeral and find out that, you know, these siblings are not talking to each other. You know, they, they just lost their mother, but instead of honoring her and grieving, they're fighting over who gets, uh, you know, the Oldsmobile station wagon, right? Now, you might shake your head at that, but here's the deal. We all have a tendency to prioritize temporary things. We put an emphasis on the wrong areas of life. We, we in, in relationships, take a back seat to money and possessions and stuff. So let's move on. In verse 14, Jesus replies. Verse 14, Jesus replied, Man, who appointed you, or who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? He's going to turn this into a teachable moment, right? And he begins to tell this parable. Skip down to verse 16. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. So here you got this rich man, and he's got more than what he knows what to do with. He's not sure how to handle his wealth, and so he's, he's beginning to weigh his options. Look at verse 18. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns, and I will build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. This rich man is stuck in the here. He's focused on the temporary. He's focused on himself. To him, life is all about the temporary pleasures and the the comforts of this world. But here's the deal in the story. God looks down from heaven and he sees this man living for himself. And God has something to say about it. Look at verse 20 with me. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but 
is not rich towards God. And right there is the problem. The problem is not that this guy had extra. His problem wasn't that he had abundant crop. It's that he wasn't rich towards God. He wasn't using what God had given him for eternal purpose. He was using it for his own temporary pleasure and comfort. And Jesus says this man is a fool because he made all those plans, but he was going to die tonight. Now, here's what I want us to notice about this story. Uh, Jesus isn't telling a story uh, about a guy who, who has this huge inheritance, right? And then he goes and he blows everything that he has foolishly on really stupid stuff. He's not talking about somebody who used his money on drugs and wild women, right? This guy is trying to be responsible. He's saving for the future. This guy's planning for the future, and, and isn't this exactly the type of person that we admire? Somebody that saves for the future? But Jesus says, no, he's a fool. He's a fool because he keeps focusing on the long term, but he's not thinking long term enough. He's thinking 30 years from now. But what about 30,000 years from now? What are you going to do what are you going to do one day when you're standing before God? Do you think that God is going to be impressed with your financial portfolio? Do you think that God is going to be impressed that you bought the latest and greatest iPhone and you spent more time messing with that phone than you did playing with your kids? Do you think that God's going to be impressed that you were able to vacation to Fiji when your neighbor was having trouble buying groceries? Oh, well, you know, what are you saying, Pastor Joshua? I, I can't have nice things. Are you saying that I can't travel? I can't save for comfortable retirement? No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm saying look beyond all of that stuff. Look beyond the comfortable retirement. Look beyond driving the nice car. Look beyond that dream vacation. There is so much more to this life. Things that are way more eternal. Jesus calls the man in the parable a fool. And it's pretty strong language. And it seems odd to us to call a man a fool who has the biggest house on the block, who seems to be so successful. But here's why he's a fool. For all of this man's entrepreneurial achievements, for all of his ability to run cost-benefit analysis uh, and cash flow projections, there's one scenario that he hasn't prepared for, and that is the scenario of eternity. Jesus never says that the man was a fool for having treasure here on this earth but that he didn't think about his eternal treasure, that he wasn't rich towards God. And then in verse 33, Jesus kind of wraps this teaching up. Um, it's a very similar passage to the one that we read in 1 Timothy. Uh, look at verse 33 with me. He says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says, this is the lens by which you need to look at your life. That, that eternity, it's how you need to weigh your decisions. Eternity is how you need to make your investments. What's this going to do in eternity? Adoniram Judson faced nearly 40 years of op opposition in Burma. 40 years of suffering. But you know what? That was temporary. In those 40 years, he and his wife translated the entire Bible into the Burmese language. Yeah, uh, Adoniram outlived seven of his own children, but when Adoniram died, there were more than 8,000 children of God in Burma. 
Today there are more than 3,700 churches that can all trace their beginning back to the day that Adoniram and Ann Judson decided to set sail to Burma. They may have suffered, but they left an eternal legacy. So let me ask you, what are you focused on this morning? Are you focused on the here? Are you focused on the temporary? Or are you focused on the there? Are you focused on the eternal? Are you storing up treasures for yourself here on this earth? Or are you storing them up there on, in, in eternity where no thieves are going to come near, where no moths are going to destroy? Are you worried more about the stuff here that you can attain? Or are you focused on what you can do for the kingdom of God? Are you rich in good deeds? Are you rich towards God? I want to ask you, right now in your living room, to make a decision this morning that affects eternity. The decision is going to be different for everybody, right? It might mean trusting Jesus with your life. Listen, if you have never trusted Jesus with your life, then I ask you this morning to surrender yourself to Jesus today. The Bible tells us that salvation is a free gift given by God for all those who would accept it. All you have to do is you have to repent. Repent of this life that you've lived. This life that you've lived for yourself, self where you have stored up treasure for yourself, that you've focused on yourself, that you've done everything for yourself. Repent of that. And repent basically means just to do a 180, to change your mind and to agree with God. To repent of the way you've lived your life and begin living life for God. The Bible says that when we do that, when we come to Jesus and we surrender ourselves, and when we repent of the life that we've lived and we decide to start following Jesus, the Bible says that in that moment you are saved, that you become a child of God. And that is a, a decision that affects eternity. And so that may be the decision that you need to make this morning. Or maybe the decision that you need to make is financial. Maybe you need to step out in faith and trust Jesus with your finances. Maybe you need to designate some of your retirement uh, to bless a ministry when you pass away. Maybe you need to take what you've been saving to go on that vacation. And maybe you need to take that and bless the church or bless a, a missionary or bless some other ministry. Maybe the decision that you need to make is how you spend your time. Perhaps you need to spend more time paying attention to your family and less attention with technology. Maybe you need to forgive a family member for being greedy with an inheritance. Can I tell you something? That relationship is so much more important than the issue. So much more important. Maybe the decision that you need to make is to step out and start doing ministry whether that's working in the church or volunteering in the children's ministry or in the teen ministry, teaching a Sunday school class, visiting a nursing home, uh, volunteering at the Pregnancy Resource Center, mentoring a child through young faith in Christ. Maybe you need to begin supporting a missionary. Whatever that decision is, I'm challenging each and every single one of you today to make a decision with a focus on eternity. Don't just think long term, think eternity. God bless you.